Welcome everyone to Walk on Perspective. I'm your host, Robert Boswell. Thank you so very much for listening in as you do each and every week. I am thrilled to acknowledge and announce our guest today, Adam Emenecker. Adam, thank you for joining us today. Robert, appreciate you having me. There are uh, there are a few causes I support, quite like the Walk On cause. So happy to be here on the Walk On Perspective. I'm sure for those who are tuning in, you're probably reading the guest list and you're seeing, hey, I remember that name. Adam's story is one that we were all caught up in in the moment. One of those fantastic Cinderella stories from back in 2007, 2008, as he was playing college basketball in the Missouri Valley Conference at Drake University. And Adam, I want to take us, I want you to take us back, mm. paint us a picture from start to finish, because we're, we're going to unpack a lot of this. Mm. But I want you to give us an idea, kind of, you know, growing up, how you ultimately ended up getting to Drake. I know you're from Saginaw, Michigan, I believe, is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So from, kind of from, us through. I know high school, you're multi-sport athlete, you're getting some looks for baseball, you obviously have a passion to play basketball at the next level. Give us an idea in high school, kind of your mindset of what you were looking to do at the next level. Sure. So growing up, I, I knew I was always in sports. Sports was something that I always enjoyed. And I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, as you mentioned, which is a huge sports town, and especially at that time really well known for basketball, really well known for football. And I feel very fortunate to have grown up around a lot of great athletes. Uh, so a few names that people might know, it was a town of probably 50,000 people at that time, a little less these days. Uh, Jason Richardson went to my high school, former slam dunk champion a couple of times through. Charles Rogers went to our crosstown rival, number two pick of uh, the Detroit Lions out of Michigan State. Uh, Lamar Woodley, guy that played in, uh, at Michigan, at football linebacker, played in the NFL for the Steelers for a number of years. All those guys, plus a couple other guys, Anthony Roberson played at Florida. So there was there was a ton of basketball talent in the city, and that that really was the the focus growing up of wanting to put on the jersey. As you mentioned, I went to Arthur Hill High School. We put our crosstown rival Saginaw High School. When you were growing up, you're in elementary school, you're in middle school, what you dreamed about was putting on that jersey and getting an opportunity and a chance to play, whether it's going to football games, whether it's going to basketball games, whether it was going to baseball games. And, and for me, I was never the most athletic necessarily, but just wanted to find an opportunity and a chance to compete. And uh, fortunately, had the chance to play a couple of sports during my high school tenure. Uh, which I think helped me a ton. So I played baseball, basketball, and football. I think each one you learn unique and individual skills that allows you to find a different edge in each individual sport as well. Uh, but as I went through my high school career, something about the game of basketball, something about the amount of time on the clock, something about the way five guys move together in concert with one another on the floor, just it it just really was special for me and something I wanted to make sure I took part in. And as you mentioned, had an opportunity to uh, potentially play baseball in college. In many ways, I think baseball was probably my better sport athletically. But I was fortunate uh, on the basketball side to be on a really talented high school team. We were number one in the state for a short period of time, didn't end the way we wanted to. But we had, I think, in total from our roster, seven guys play Division One basketball. So we were deep. We played hard against yeah. each other and, uh, you know, having growing up in an environment like that, such an athletic rich environment, such tradition and so much talent around you. It continued to help push me to figure out how I can make a difference, how I compete and how I can earn time that I get on the floor. That's incredible. And that, that many eventual college athletes on one high school roster, that, that's amazing. I bet there were some spirited practices. Well, I think we were we were very lucky that uh, I believe our entire starting five played Division One basketball, at least in some capacity, maybe not all the way through. Uh, very lucky that a number of us started as sophomores. And, and so I think when you look throughout the course of my athletic career, one of the things I've been fortunate to be a part of is groups that started building and got to a crescendo got to a point where the team grew together and became really successful. And for me on the high school side in, in basketball, we started, we had seven sophomores on varsity when I was a sophomore 
And by the time we were seniors, those seven seniors got a chance to, to really compete at a high level and band together and, and try to figure out how the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. And again, I think a, a big part of that for me is for my focus throughout whatever sport I was playing is how do I figure out a way to help make the other people around me better? And how do you help figure out how to earn their trust? And uh, for us as a team to continue to evolve over the course of those years. And for me as an individual, that became a big part of my success. Sure. Yeah. And, and I can't wait to unpack some of that success with you at the college level here in a moment. But I, I want to delve a little bit deeper, Adam, because you know, anybody can do a quick Google search of you and your history and see kind of where you ended up. But I want a little bit more behind the story of why Drake, who were you mm -hmm. talking to at the time, who was looking at you as a potential baseball player at the next level? Uh, how did you ultimately uh, decide, you know what, I'm going to take a chance on myself and I'm going to play the sport that I'm more passionate about in basketball. And I'm going to go to Des Moines, Iowa mm. to do it. Give us an idea, a little bit, a little bit more in depth. Yeah. It's uh, you know, it's funny how those, those conversations happen and it's funny the way things shake out. Sometimes the world just has a way to help keep you centered. Right. So uh, going into my junior season from a basketball perspective, I was looking for opportunities. I, I visited a couple Division one schools on unofficial visits, Oakland University in Michigan. I was getting looked at by schools like Navy, lower level Division one schools. Uh, had a couple opportunities to play Division two, went on a couple of Division two visits, but I, I, I just felt like wherever, whoever I was talking to, it didn't feel right. Uh, I didn't have any Division one offers, didn't have any Division one opportunities, and went into my senior season and decided, you know what, I'm just I've got to keep this out of my mind for now. Let's focus. Um, went through the year, no offers presented themselves. So was was still talking to coaches, was still in communication, uh, but nothing, no result that I was really interested in. I transitioned after my senior season of basketball into baseball, thinking basketball is probably done. I'm I'm probably not going to play anymore. This is this is kind of going to be the end of the road. And decided to focus on baseball and went into the high school baseball season went into even summer baseball after that. And that, that was really where I was mentally moving to the next level to play baseball. And so I actually had my deposit paid and was planning to uh, go to Boston college. And in July, after I'd graduated high school. So after my senior season, I decided to take a trip to Des Moines because I'd heard from uh, the, the coaches at Drake that, hey, if there was a walk or if I wanted it, there was a walk on spot, I would have a jersey. And so for more than anything else, I took a flight from Michigan, from Saginaw, Michigan, coming to Des Moines, Iowa, July after I'd graduated, just thinking, I'm just going to cross it off the list. I'm going to get a free weekend, get out of my head, cross it off the list, go home, go to Boston College, et cetera, et cetera. And when I came to Des Moines, I thought, Something about this place is just right. It, it's a nice city. There's a lot of good around here. And I, I just, through some soul searching, decided I want to play basketball. That, that's the sport that is going to, I, I need to figure out, can I make it? And is this something I want to do? And so I, I looked at Drake. And at the time, Drake and is, continues to be in the Missouri Valley Conference. Missouri Valley Conference, one of the best mid-majors in the country. At that time, there were schools like Creighton and Southern Illinois that were consistent year in and year out in the NCAA tournament. And so I thought, if I'm going to be able to compete, this is the level I want to compete. So with a month before school starting, uh, I decided that I was going to transition and go to Drake. And so went through and finalized all the application process and a month later, I was on campus and uh, hadn't played basketball in a few months, but started to try to get back in shape and uh, and make sure I could at least compete a little bit uh, by the time I got to school. That's great. Now, you were in kind of a, 
a different position than some other walk-ons. And that, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, you actually did have at least a, a partial academic scholarship to attend Drake, which I think is a private university. So yes. obviously you had taken care of your studies at the high school level enough to at least offset a portion of that tuition with an academic scholarship. Uh, a lot of walk-ons, you know, they, they're, they're going in, it's 100% out of pocket. So kudos to you for obviously putting your school first. Uh, I'm glad that you kind of unpacked that a little bit about the city of Des Moines. Uh, I would be willing to bet that a lot of our listeners probably listening in that normally listen in every week probably haven't been to Des Moines. Mm. Uh, surprisingly, I have. Uh, mm. Des Moines is a, a wonderful little set. I was just very overwhelmed because I went in uh, just for context. I'm from Tennessee. I live in okay. Nashville. Yep. And I had never been. I had this preconceived notion that I guess yep. it was just going to be like endless corn for <laughs> as long as I could see. Now, and there was some of that, right? Yep. But Des Moines is a, a wonderful little town. I loved it. The The river that runs through it and yep. then the golden dome of the Capitol building is, I mean, it's a gorgeous little downtown area. Uh, we ate at a, a, a place called Fong's Pizza. I mean, yep. The place was awesome. I mean, yep. Des Moines was a really nice surprise, to be honest with you. Yeah, there are there are very few people that come here and aren't pleasantly surprised. So if you look at Des Moines, the, just the city in and of itself is a little under 200,000 people, but greater Des Moines is called 750 or 800,000, which is a decent size. And so there, there are no, there aren't the tier one professional sports teams. We don't have the NFL. We don't have the NBA. We don't have the MLB. We don't have the NHL, but we do have a G League team. We do have the AAA affiliate of the Cubs. And I, I've heard from people that live out of or come from out of town, myself included, that pretty much anything you get where you are, you can get in Des Moines. This city has come a long way over the last 20, 25 years, not only from growth and infrastructure, but culture, restaurants, all that stuff. If you've never been, I know it's not going to be first on your list, but if you have an excuse to come to Des Moines, I promise you won't be disappointed. I can attest to that. I absolutely enjoyed my time. I was only there, I think, uh, uh, an extended weekend. It was just for work. It was an yep. extended three-day weekend. But yeah, you mentioned the culture. We ate at a Lebanese restaurant, and mm -hmm. I was a little iffy. I was like, I don't know if I want Lebanese in Des Moines, Iowa. But it was fantastic. Yeah, there <laughs> is uh, the 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 restaurant scene. The restaurant scene here has come a long way in the in the fifteen to twenty years that I've been here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. So I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. I mentioned the pride that I have in the hometown, in my hometown where I, where I grew up, a lot of similar pride with Des Moines, especially for people that give you a side eye when they hear you live in Iowa, you gotta <laughs> visit Des Moines at least once. There's not a lot outside to your point. You drive 20 minutes in any direction. You might be in a cornfield, but within that pocket, within the metropolis, there's a lot to offer in Des Moines. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I guess you had mentioned, you know, not having major sports there. I guess the majority of the sports allegiances are probably going to be to the greater Chicago area teams, right? Chicago, Minnesota, you get St. Louis. Uh, so it, it's uh, you get Kansas City. So it's an interesting okay. melting pot of sports fandom uh, as well. And of course, you get people that look at and, and much like I'm sure you notice in the South, you get people that take Iowa football, Iowa basketball, Iowa State football, Iowa State basketball very seriously and yeah. really never let their fandom down. Yeah, I, I've never had the opportunity to go to Iowa City, but I've been to Ames and mm. good Lord, if people in, in Des Moines are anywhere as sports crazy as the people up in Ames, then goodness gracious, <laughs> that, that is next level. Uh, but I, I wanted to now kind of transition Adam back to you and your story. Now that we've already given, you know, the, the great city of Des Moines kind of a, a boost in tourism, mm. but <laughs> you, you arrive at Drake, you're, you're granted the preferred walk on opportunity mm -hmm. that you said that they had said would be available. Should you choose to take it now for those who aren't you're familiar with that process when you are a preferred walk on people will probably see that it's abbreviated as you know pwo you see you see a lot of that especially around signing day for basketball yep. and football now that means the coaches want you and you don't necessarily have to try out like you have a spot but we just don't have a scholarship for you now now if you were to come in and really impress maybe that could be afforded to you down the road sure. uh, that was that kind of how it was explained to you and presented 
Yeah. And I, so when I, when I got here, yes, on, on preferred walk-on status. And um, we were, Drake at that time had, I think, five walk-ons. And so a big part of the, uh, the coach I played for my first three years was Dr. Tom Davis. Dr. Tom Davis previously coached at Iowa. He coached at Boston College. And it was kind of towards the sunset of his career that he was coaching at Drake. And he'd had success with, success with walk-ons at those previous stops. And so he was more open, honestly, than a lot of coaches were to be able to put walk-ons on the roster. And, uh, you know, I, I think it, it provides a couple of different things, right? It provides the school an opportunity to really have a free opportunity. They're not paying a scholarship. It's a student paying their way. But it's an opportunity to see if there's something you like in somebody how does that manifest itself over a month, three months, six months, a year, what have you, to see if that can turn into something from a player's perspective? And, and what it meant for me is it just meant it meant a chance to compete. And so for, outside of, you know, going to play pickup somewhere, now I get an opportunity to play against guys that are playing Division One basketball, that are succeeding in Division One basketball. And I get to do that every day. And so I can try to figure out how, how do I stack up? And I can try to figure out, can I earn these guys' trust? Can I figure out a way to be in the mix? And so if you think about my first maybe month, two months, three months, it was really just, how do I fit in? Not a lot to lose. How do I fit in and, and figure out a way to compete uh, from a basketball lens? I want to start to transition into your playing career at Drake. The first couple of years, uh, your playing time is kind of in, in mop-up duty in spots, mm -hmm. and then you know a little bit more in your second season, then even into the third season, you're kind of that that reserve role off the bench where your minutes are going up. Uh, you're you're starting to see some actual statistics show up on some of the the game charts, but it's really not until that that fourth magical year where you blossom and obviously explode out onto the national scene. Talk to us about those first couple of years and maybe kind of the, the, the struggle of not getting the opportunities when you're putting in the same amount of work as all the scholarship guys. And it, it just, it hasn't quite happened for you yet. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's hard. And, and a lot of it comes back to how much self-motivation, how much, can you continue to push yourself to know that I'm moving in the right direction? And at some point, I just have to be ready for the opportunity. And so I, I think a lot of it for me, I give a ton of credit to a couple guys that were seniors when I was a freshman and seniors when I was a sophomore that really helped take me under their wing in a sense and give me confidence and say that we see what you're doing and we see what you're capable of. And even to have, and, and going back, Robert, to what I said a, a minute ago, you know, going into those pickup games and just trying to fit in, having somebody want you on their team, going from somebody no one knows to having somebody that wants you on their team to pick you over a scholarship player when you can only play 10. I mean, that, that goes, that, those kind of things go a long way. And, and I think a lot of it for me, having that encouragement and a close, the close knit relationships with a few of my teammates, especially the older guys made a huge difference. And it, it helped keep me going because that's what teammates are there to do. Support each other, especially when, when times are tough and when it's easy, when it's easy to struggle and when it's easy to get down and when it's easy to give up. And so I, I think for me, it was trying to maintain that level of, of team first, right? Because even if I'm not playing, I still want us to win. And so it's my job to help our team win, no matter what that means. And then keeping and having the right relationships and the right uh, mentors and the right people around you to help continue to push and challenge and drive. And, and sometimes that meant I felt like my role was to get people in the gym more and, and try to go and get shots up. Sometimes that way people would do the same thing for me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not always fun. But being around the group, being a part of a team is something that is really hard to replace. And that, that kept me going. And ultimately, you're waiting for when does the opportunity present itself? And when the opportunity presents itself, you just hope you're ready to make an impact. Any of you young athletes out there listening to Adam speak there, I hope you're taking notes because that's gold right there. I mean, that that is the 
the blueprint for what you need to do for the under recruited athlete that's hoping to play at the next level. I want to just before getting to that 2008 season, I want mm-hmm. I want to go over probably a, a massive milestone and kind of a culmination for you of all the hard work that had finally paid off. Uh, I want to say, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's the, just before the start of, uh, I guess it was your third year you are afforded, you earned a scholarship to play at Drake. What was that moment like for you, Adam? How was it presented? Did you see it coming? Was it in like a team meeting? Was it after practice? And I just paint us a picture of kind of where were you, what that moment meant for you. Yeah. So it, it was actually right before my last year, before my senior year. And uh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of transition. So my first three years, the team was relatively intact, a lot of uh, roster continuity and the same guys that were playing kind of continued to play. And there was maybe one or two guys that floated in and out, but we had a lot of roster continuity and we were, we were okay, but we weren't good. We were around 500, uh, usually toward the bottom half of the league. And uh, after my third year, Dr. Tom Davis uh, decided that he was going to retire. So he was done coaching. We graduated five seniors, three or four of which were starters And so there was a lot of roster change. Dr. Tom's son, Keno Davis, is the one who took over as coach. So he was an assistant on the team. We knew of him. But going into my last year, I'd actually had shoulder surgery toward the end of my junior year, uh, ended ended my season probably a month or so early. And so going into that summer, I knew new coach, change in our roster, a lot of guys turning over. I'm coming off shoulder surgery and it was really, it created an opportunity for me to one last hurrah. Let's see how it goes. This is, this is a bit of a clean slate. The way the scholarship happened, uh, we'd actually, we played a preseason tournament. We did our, our pre our non our out of season trip. Uh, We went to the Bahamas in the off season, played against the Bahamian national team, played against a couple of professional teams there and I was in a position that I was the starting point guard at that time. And so with, with our group, we started to notice that we had a little bit of chemistry. Uh, and coming back from that trip, we had a person that uh, was on scholarship that decided to leave the program and pursue something else. And so within probably that trip, we got back maybe three weeks before school started and probably the week before school started, with that open scholarship, uh, they called me into the offices and said, hey, uh, you know, we have a lot to look forward to this year and um, we have an open scholarship and like we'd like to offer that to you. Pretty underwhelming in terms of hoopla and event per what you mentioned. They do much, a much better job of that today to make sure to surprise people. Uh, but, you know, I was I was happy. I was uh, I, I, I Felt good about it. Obviously, the financial component about that is is, is nothing to sneeze at. But, you know, more than anything else, it felt like a little bit of vindication for the work. But my focus was. How do I justify it? How do we make sure that uh, that we continue to me as an individual, but we as a group have a better year than we've had in years past and meet uh, and accomplish some of our goals? And so it was something that that made me smile. It helped me get into a couple of meetings that I wasn't in before as a as a walk on. But, uh, you know, the focus really became on became the upcoming season. That's great. You, you hear so often, especially in athletics, with people always using the, the old adage, you know, w- wanting to prove somebody wrong. However, in this instance, you really wanted to prove them right sure. for betting on you and in affording you that scholarship. And that's immediately your reaction and your thought process is, OK, I got to now prove to them that they were right and that I, you know, I owe it to myself to really you know, put, put that extra effort in going into this last year. So, I mean, again, young athletes take notes. That is the approach that you certainly need to be using. I, I don't know though, that I necessarily agree, Adam, with the, the underwhelmingness hmm. of that week that you're talking about. I mean, you're, you're, you're in the Bahamas, right? Mm -hmm. And then after an opportunity of being in the Bahamas in that same week, all of a sudden it's like, oh, and by the way, you're now on scholarship. And I mean, I, if my timeline is right, I guess you're what, 21 years old at the time. 
Yeah, 20, probably 21, 22. So after a week in the Bahamas and then having earned a scholarship and coming back and knowing you're about to ball out on the court this mm. season and be a rock star around campus, you're a 21 year old young man living in downtown Des Moines. I, I bet it was probably not underwhelming at the time. I bet that there was some type of celebratory uh, moments that week, probably. Not really, honestly. I mean, I, really? I think a, a lot of it, a lot of it came back to, you know, the, the focus is forward. And uh, one of the things that I've, that I've mentioned to people over time is, you know, you, you, you sometimes work so hard and you spend so much time thinking about how do you get to the next opportunity? Sometimes when you cross those thresholds, because it's your life and it's what you're used to, it just kind of feels normal and it's what you want. And so if you're, trying to achieve something and you achieve it now what's the next thing and and move on to the next so was i happy was i grateful did i feel good about it yes 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 check those boxes but at the same time you know it going into the season it didn't feel like something to celebrate it felt like something to justify and so how do we get to the next thing both for me again as an individual as well as us as a team so, so no going out to dinner afterwards, no uh, drink Not with a that friend. I remember. You, did you even call your parents at all? I mean, or was it just oh, like I'm business? Sure, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I did. Again, I don't mean to sound like I wasn't excited, but I, I don't know that it was a, uh, I don't know that it was a sliding doors type of moment where, uh, you know, there, there is nothing that stands out to me in my head of this happened. And so I did. It, uh, you know, it just kind of was on to the next thing. I got to tell you, Adam, I'm like loving the mental picture right now of you just like, you know, shaking hands with coach and then going right back to the dorm and, and studying for your physics exam the next morning. Yep, that's about right. <laughs> that's fantastic. So let's fast forward into that season and how that changed your life. I mean, and, and it's probably still affecting your yeah. life uh, in, right now in this moment. I mean, it, it, had it not been for that season, we're not having this conversation right now, yeah. right? That, that season, and for our listeners who are unfamiliar with your story, who probably need a little bit more context, I mean, it is the most magical season that Drake had had since arguably the 60s, right? And they peel off... 21 straight victories when the the Missouri Valley Conference and you are the one leading the team through that season as the on-field general setting all-time school records for assists in a career you're named MVC tournament MVP you win not only the regular season but also the tournament and it's a NCAA tournament berth for the first time in eons talk to us about that particular year not just your whole career but that sure. one special magical season and what that ride was like sure so we 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 had a lot of roster turnover and i think a, a lot of uncertainty going into that season so preseason we were picked ninth and expectations honestly were low one of the stories that floated around des moines especially later into the year when we had media day uh i didn't even no one even interviewed me and, you know, to me, that seemed normal at the time. That's how it went uh, throughout the rest of the three years. Obviously, that kind of that changed, that tone changed as we got to the end of the year. But uh, expectations low, pick ninth in the conference. And, you know, I, I think as a team, we, we had guys that hadn't necessarily had a lot of opportunity, but uh, were, had been around the program. And, and so Leonard Houston and Clayton Corver. We're both uh, in there, Clayton in his fifth year, Leonard was in his fourth year. We had two fourth year juniors, Jonathan Cox and Brent Heemskirk, and then a really talented sophomore in Josh Young, who was the leading scorer in the state of Oklahoma as a senior in high school a couple of years earlier. That was really our core and our nucleus. And I, I think we felt good that we were going to be better than expectations. And I think we felt good that we had a, we had a, a good chemistry. And we, our goal was to play in the postseason. It's something that we'd never had the opportunity to do. And so it was just, let's exceed expectations. Let's accomplish our goal. And as, as the year started, and I mentioned that trip to the Bahamas was something that was really special for us. It was an opportunity for us to bond off the floor in, in just a unique and different way. We were there for probably five days, basically locked up at Atlantis on a resort with your best friends, which was awesome, with a little bit of basketball mixed in. 
And, and so that, that wave kind of continued and, and carried us a bit. And as, as we got into practices, I think we realized that our style and how we play was going to be a little different than years past. And that, you know, maybe, maybe there was a chance for us to compete. And so we went, we went into the season, we lost a game early on against St. Mary's St. Mary's obviously has had a very rich history in basketball. It was our second game of the year. They had Patty Mills. They had a couple of guys that were all conference guys year in and year out. And we lost by six at St. Mary's and that it's a, it was a pretty stinking good team. And I think it helped us realize that we didn't, we didn't do anything special to be close in that game. I think it helped us understand and realize that it, as long as we do what we're supposed to do, as long as we play our style, we have a chance. And uh, you mentioned 21 straight games. After that game, we won 21 in a row. And every one seemed to build on itself and build on, a, on, on one another. So we played at that time. There were home and homes with Iowa and Iowa State. Uh, so we played Iowa State at home. Iowa State had Wesley Johnson, who ended up being the number four pick in the draft, and Craig Brackens, who was a, a top 15 or maybe top 20 pick as well. Uh, we beat Iowa State by 35 points in probably one of the best games we ever played. Uh, we play, went to, traveled to Iowa, and we beat Iowa by five or six or something like that. And so we, we started pick wins in the non-conference and started conference play and started getting a lot more attention, not only in the city, but around the league and around the country, uh, got into, into conference play, and again, just kind of started ticking through wins. And it wasn't that we, we didn't have adversity, that things didn't come up. But for whatever reason, because of how tight we were and because of how much trust we had in one another, we just figured out a way that somebody was going to make a play at the end of the game to, to, to help move us in the right direction. And uh, a lot of balls bounced our way throughout the course of that streak, won, won 21 in a row, uh, ended up going, I believe, 15 and three in conference and, and one game that was very memorable uh, at that point, ESPN did what they called the Bracket Buster Challenge, so pit a couple mid-major schools against each other. We rose as high, I think at the time, we were maybe 14th in the country, and uh, we played against Butler, who was number eight in the country at that time. So got an opportunity to be on ESPN2, which seems a little more normal now. Every game's on TV. Even back in 2008, it wasn't quite as common, uh, but had an opportunity to play in Hinkle Fieldhouse against the top 10 team. We we're fortunate enough to, to leave that game with a win. And, you know, I think overall, as the season continued to grow, even though, though we had a few slip ups here and there, so did our confidence. And uh, by the end of the year, we just felt like as long as we we're close within the last two or three minutes, we we're going to win the game. And more often than not, that's the way it shook out. Based off of kind of what I know about you and what I'm kind of hearing in your personality as we're doing this interview, I have a feeling that you, you probably are pretty good at putting the blinders on and focusing on the task at hand and not getting bogged down with any of the distractions. But I have to assume that during that 21 game win streak, and you mentioned getting some national exposure, people mm -hmm. talking about you, you're on ESPN and not just your team, but you personally, was there any point where you just kind of stopped and you're like, Oh man, this is, this is starting to blow up. Uh, I might be filling up at the map code down the road and somebody might recognize me now. I mean, did that thought ever occur to you during that season? Um, I mean, some, I, I bet, especially once you got into January or February, I was probably doing close to an hour to an hour and a half of interviews on every non game day. And so, you know, you're, you're in front of the media a lot. And we didn't, you know, we didn't watch TV. We weren't really paying attention to the local news. Uh, we, were, we were kind of in your own insular bubble. I, I think what we noticed, I think what was different, uh, my, my first three years, we probably averaged 3,500 to 4,000 fans at a game. By the time we got to December of that season, we were selling out about 7,000, 7,100 every game. And so just the... The, the fervor around the program and around the arena and just hearing the crowd during games that you notice. And that is very much in your face and something that is easy to pay attention to in terms of, 
you know, I, I think one of the things that one of the things that I feel very fortunate to have have seen being a walk on and, and you know this. You're not getting attention from anybody there. There's not somebody that's stick, pointing you out in a crowd. You might be part of the team, but you're not you're not standing out to anybody. So, you know, I, I think um, having that mentality helps with almost not realizing and not recognizing when that when that switch flips. Uh, so, so during the season, you know, we, we were a pretty insular group and we kind of kept our, our, our mind focused on go to school, make sure you get your stuff done. But at the same time, how do we continue to focus on what we need to focus on, which is winning the next game. And uh, not, it was not until after the season that you really get the full flavor of, of what you were just talking about, which is, uh, you know, just how aware you can be of uh, who might be watching. Sure. And, and not just in the media, but goodness gracious, uh, walking to and from class. Now, hmm. fortunately, at the time frame that you're talking about, we're talking Des Moines, Iowa in, in December, January and February. So you're going to be uh, pretty thickly layered anyway, got the hoodie over you. And it, yep. it, but there has to have at least been a couple of times you're just trying to you, you're pushing the clock. You're like five minutes late. You're trying to get to chemistry. And then all of a sudden it's just like, hey, there's there's Evanecker. Mm. Hey, let's go. Let's go get a, a, a picture. I mean, there had to have been some of that. Right. You know, I think we noticed that more if we were playing on the road um, towards the end of the year, there'd be people scoping out our hotels and looking for autographs or we would see uh, people coming just to wave to our bus and, and all those kind of things. But for the most part on campus. So Drake's a relatively small school, I'll call it 3,500, 4,000 undergraduate students. And because of that, everyone kind of knows everybody anyway. And so, you know, maybe if we're, maybe if we're out and about on campus and in a certain, in a certain capacity, you get a little bit more of uh, that type of attention, but, you know, for the most part, again, during the season, maybe it happened and we just didn't pay attention. Uh, but uh, we, we, we're able to stay pretty focused. Adam, that kind of is an, an interesting segue into my next question. July 1st of this past year, 2021, mm. college athletics, as we know it, was changed forever and is yes, still evolving. Uh, name, image, and likeness yep. is now completely changed college athletics. Had that been available as you were going through that Cinderella run, how do you think that that would have, one, affected you personally, affected just kind of your mindset and kind of how you went about your daily grinds, preparing each and every day? Uh, and, you know, do you, do you almost wish that that had been in place as you were at Drake back in 2007, 2008, and during that magical run? Yeah, I mean, the, the name, image, likeness stuff, I am 100% fully behind. I, I think to restrict, to artificially restrict athletes from, or anyone in college, if you're artificially restricting them from their earnings potential, that just, you know, it, it seems kind of silly, especially with part of what you see out of the NCAA, which is, it's very much a business, right? And so you're profiting off of these kids and, and we don't have to go through and litigate that. Fortunately, that's, that's already a reality today. But, you know, I, I think one of the things that always stood out to me, um, part, of, part of having news cameras at practice every day, news cameras on campus, news cameras uh, at all, at all the games and post games and having a microphone in front of you and having to answer questions that one of the things a reporter of mine that I became friendly with said is he said, you know, I like you, but if you ever get a DUI, I'm going to be the first one that puts you on the front page of the newspaper. And I understand if we're not friends. And so, you know, as an athlete, you're in this position where you have a lot of eyes on you and there is benefit and, and the benefit of that that's what you're after, not necessarily the admiration, but what you're after is the opportunity to compete. And what you're after is, you know, being able to play at the highest level, but having that in the back of my head, especially as I relate it back to name image likeness, there was a lot more risk for me at that time in terms of what I would, what I could do that would derail me. than there was reward for how I could continue to 
capitalize on that, that recognition and notoriety. And so I, I think where name image likeness comes in, and I have no idea how I would have handled that. I have no idea what opportunities would have presented themselves. But what I do know is, you know, for, for at that time, because of all the decisions I could have made that would have been setbacks, you know, to, to not be able to balance that out with other ample opportunities to be rewarded, uh, you know, it just, it felt a little out of balance. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how that would have went 10, 12, 15 years ago, but uh, I am happy that the go forward and for athletes today, that that is, that is very much an opportunity that they get to take advantage of. Yeah, it is a wild, wild west of a landscape to have to navigate now. And I'm excited to watch it unfold as new opportunities, probably ones that haven't even been thought of, right. are going to start to pop up. I, I, I can't wait to look back on, on athletics 10 years from now and see how it's changed. Now, you know, it, it may have not been, you know, allowed or whatever the word is back in the time that you were in school there. Sure. However, after your time at Drake was over with, there was at least some small NIL type situation. You knew I was going to ask you about this. This <laughs> is the number one thing I've, I've been waiting to ask you for because I'm so intrigued by it. There is a local restaurant, right, in in downtown Des Moines, Iowa, uh, the barbecue joint, and they have a food challenge. This, this kind of went viral on man versus food. I'm sure that you've seen it. You get asked about it all the time. Mm -hmm. They have, I want to say, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like a four pound mammoth burger and a pound of fries. It's called the Emmenecker and it's a challenge and people, they'll flock from out of town to try and, and, and take down this beast of a burger. So many questions here, Adam. I mean, <laughs> one, how did this come up in the first mm -hmm. place? Were you contacted by the manager of the restaurant? Two, have you tried it? Three, have, have, were you successful? How many people randomly text you? It was just like, dude, I tried the burger challenge and I failed miserably. Like, I, I can't wait to unpack this. So, yeah, I mean, it is a funny story. And you mentioned it, it has a lot of corollaries with uh, NIL. So the restaurant Jethro's opened in April of 2008. I graduated, I was done with basketball in March and then graduated in May of 2008. So once my senior season was over, this restaurant opened right on campus and it was, it was immediately a success, the restaurant was. A uh, lot of activity. Unfortunately, they weren't open when we were playing because they could have gotten some of the traffic from games, but they've continued to uh, take advantage of that since. But uh, after, I don't know, probably a month of operation, I ran into the owner somewhere and he said, you know, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make Jethro's identifiable with Drake. We want to make Jethro's identifiable with Des Moines. And we want to make it so that this is the place when people come from out of town, it's the first place they think of. And he said, well, part of what I want to do is I want to create a food challenge that's going to be that draw and I'd like to name it after you. And so the first time somebody tells you that, you're just like, yeah, okay, you shake hands, you smile and you walk away and think, I don't know what that guy's thinking, but that's nuts. And uh, okay, look forward to hearing from him again. Turns out, found an opportunity to, uh, or found a chance to talk to him again. And uh, he said, no, I'm serious. Why don't you come by the restaurant and let's figure out how we're going to make this thing. And so they asked me, what are some of the things I liked? What are some of the things that would fit well together? And I sat with the owner, the general manager, and the head chef, trying to figure out what's the right combination of things. And uh, gosh, now... 14 years later, that thing has taken on a life of its own. And fortunately or unfortunately, my name is unique enough that when people see and hear Emmenecker, there is uh, pretty close to an immediate association between the two. And, and so uh, it, now that restaurant has, I believe, eight or nine locations around Greater Des Moines. It's a, it's a pretty popular spot in this area. And uh, you mentioned man versus food. ESPN had a sandwich challenge. There have been a number of things that have highlighted this sandwich over time, and it's uh, it's taken on a life of its own. So to answer your second question, uh, I have eaten it one time. I was still in training and playing at that point, but uh, I was playing overseas at the time. That was before there was a time limit. So there was not a 15-minute time limit as there is today. 
And I did eat the whole thing in one sitting. I would guess it took me probably 25 minutes. We didn't time it, but it, it was a mid afternoon meal. I didn't eat dinner that day. I didn't eat breakfast the next morning. And uh, I can tell you after eating five pounds of food and especially a heavy barbecue food, the meat sweats are very, very much a real thing. I think I was oozing barbecue sauce for about the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it tastes good, but it's a lot. Do you have any idea, Adam, the caloric content of this burger? I do. It's uh, it the, just consider it three to four days worth of food from a calorie perspective. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is incredible! <laughs> this is incredible. So when when you are presented with this food challenge, right? Like, there's obviously got to be like a spectacle in the restaurant where they, I assume that they announce it. And, you know, the, the waitress is like, all right, you know, we're, we're going to start the timer is, is there typically, I, I assume kind of a mass group uh, you're surrounded and all everybody stops eating in the restaurant and everybody's eyes are just on you for the next 15 minutes. Yeah, I don't I don't know that people want to watch it that intently because there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot going in and out at that time. So you don't necessarily want to watch too closely, but it's definitely it's definitely a spectacle. And they very much announce it. Anybody that's trying the challenge, uh, there are a lot of people that have gotten their picture on the wall for failing. Not many have had their picture on the wall for succeeding. But anytime the thing comes out, I mean, it's the size of my head, basically, when you see it come out of the kitchen on a plate. Uh, People pay attention and notice. And when they announce the 15 minute time time frame, there's a lot of wandering eyes trying to figure out, uh, first of all, how in the heck does somebody eat that much? And, and second of all, trying to keep an eye just to, to see if they have any shot and finishing within the time frame. After taking down this beast, have you tried it again? Or is it like, no, I've done one one time is God, like no. Yeah, one, one now what I what I have done. So friends and I will split it four ways. So if you cut it four ways, you actually get a full meal. There's a lot of different meats, a lot of variety on it. But um, man, there is uh, I've, I'm not going to do it again. It's a lot of food. <laughs> I, I love hearing you say, Adam, about how it's kind of risen to where it's its own unique yeah. celebrity, the the food challenge. And it's, you know, the further removed you get from your playing career and the more exposure it gets. I mean, there's probably a point to where like the the food challenge is now more popular and it's named after you. I mean, a quick Google search. I think it was like the second result that popped yeah. up. It's yeah, I mean, it tremendous. is it, it is that that point was probably 12 years ago that uh, the the recognition of the sandwich outgrew the reputation of of whatever whatever uh, recognition that I had at the moment. So it is uh, it, it is very much sandwich dominant. That is that is incredible. I, I have this is definitely a walk on perspective first meeting somebody who who's part of their legacy is they have their own food challenge. I am I, I'm slightly jealous. I love it. It's just right up my alley. I, it's just tremendous. Well, we've totally gone off the rails here. Uh, but what I want to transition into next, as you had briefly kind of touched on it there about your overseas career, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about your 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 moment at Drake has gone on. It's now time to you know, transition into what stage of life you're going to enter into next uh I, I want you to bring us back to that point you're obviously kind of gauging what type of interest you might have if you were to enter into the nba draft you're probably talking to your family considering what your next step is going to be obviously you know your studies were very important to you you got your degree and you're probably looking to transition into some type of off the court career at some point in your adult life what was it about the prospect of playing in Europe that you're like, I just, I can't hang up the sneakers yet. Like I, I still have a passion for the game and I'm going to pursue that overseas. Yeah. So it, uh, you know, it's funny before the year, I actually, before the season started. So this was probably in October when we started practice, um, I interviewed and accepted a job at principal financial group, a fortune 500 company, financial services company here in Des Moines uh, to plan to start in June, or maybe it was May, May or June of that year. And so going into the season, I already had a job and that, that was my next step. That was my path. There was no question about, am I going to play basketball again? That wasn't 
wasn't something I thought about. It wasn't something that I would have even have considered a reality. And, you know, after, after we had a little bit of success as a team, I had a little bit of success as an individual. Uh, you know, we, we ended up, I mentioned, getting as high as 14th in the country. Maybe it was 12th in the country, one of those numbers, and played in the NCAA tournament. We are a five seed in the NCAA tournament. Unfortunately, lost in the first round. But, you know, going through and, and once that's over, and you kind of take stock and assess how the year went and where your opportunities exist now, trying to figure out what's next. I started having, having a couple agents reach out and ask about, hey, what, what do you think about playing basketball? And it wasn't really something I considered. I took a couple weeks off after the season, didn't really watch the NCAA tournament after we lost, had a, had a sour taste in my mouth, but just thought, you know what, if this, if this is going to be something that presents itself and this is something that's in front of me i can always go and work but when in your life do you get an opportunity to first of all first and foremost play basketball professionally just such a select group of people get to play the sport that they love and do it for money uh, but also get an opportunity to travel and a chance to travel the world and, and see a lot of different places and uh, so fortunately found uh, found an agent that helped me find a position overseas. I played in uh, in the first division, the Bundesliga in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, at the time, they were called the Deutsche Bank Skyliners, and um, you know went went over to Germany and very much had a uh, a a basketball experience that you know you're playing. It's it's really really high quality basketball, and uh, I, f I feel very fortunate that had the chance to have the. I I can say now, I got paid. To play basketball. It, it, it was something that I never considered, but uh, helped open a lot of doors and created a lot of opportunity for me, for sure. What was it like living in Germany? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is no better way to learn about yourself than to be in a grocery store where you don't recognize anything on the shelves and you don't recognize the language that people are speaking and you don't understand the cultural norms. When you're just thrown into a place that's different, uh, you learn a lot about how do you react? How do you get up every day? How do you motivate yourself? How do you challenge yourself? Fortunately, Frankfurt is an awesome city. It is very international. In Germany, pretty much everywhere you go, people speak English. Maybe there's a few here and there that won't, but uh, people were very friendly. All in all, life was pretty easy. And, and we are fortunate to have eight Americans on our team. Uh, a lot of guys that all the all the locals, except for maybe two, played college basketball in the States as well. So it was a very collegial atmosphere, got along really well as, as a team. Uh, overall, just a great experience. A, a long time. There are plenty of difficulties being away. There's the culture shock component that goes along with that. We had a 10-month season. 10 months is long. I have a ton of respect for just the mental and physical grind that professional athletes go through. I always thought like somebody not playing hard in a one minute stretch, how could they? It is hard. It is hard, not only physically, mentally, to be 100% on all the time and to prepare your body physically. It's hard to understate how difficult that was, uh, but it was, it was a great experience and, and something that I really look back on fondly. Uh, for context and piecing together the timeline, when did your playing career over there wrap up? Yep. So I, I played one year in Germany, decided that I did not want to go back to uh, the team. And I kind of collectively decided that it wasn't the right fit. And then returning back to the States, I played in the G League for at that time. Well, it was the D League at that time for the Iowa Energy for about a month or so. And then uh, after getting released, decided it was time to move on to uh, become a working stiff like everybody else. You, you mentioned a working stiff. What are you currently working in in 2022? I had to mm. double check the date. Now we're in early February. <laughs> yeah, we're living, we're living so much in the past right now. It's hard to remember where reality is. Yeah, so uh, right now I work at uh, Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's a health insurer in Iowa and South Dakota. Okay. Now, are you, are you still doing anything with the game of basketball as a coach or a mentor, uh, even if it's, you know, just with you know, church league? I mean, is, is there anything that you're still doing in, in that role? 
you know, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, sometimes what you're involved in just opens doors and creates opportunities, right? And, and for me, part of those, part of that opportunity was playing overseas, playing basketball professionally. What that's also led to for the last 10 years or so, I've worked as a color commentary, com color commentator for TV, uh, working Missouri Valley and Drake games. So it's, it's allowed me to stay involved, not only with the program, but stay involved with the conference, but also just have your hands in basketball and get that adrenaline rush of being on and being in a game, even if it's a lot less physically demanding. Uh, I've, I've also, over the last 10 years or so, uh, been running a youth basketball team. Uh, so we have, we're with All Iowa Attack right now, which is an AAU program here in Iowa. And we have uh, third through eighth graders that uh, 12 teams, 100 kids. So I'm around the game plenty, sometimes maybe uh, maybe more than I should be. But the, the passion for basketball, I mean, it, it's such a part of your life. And you know this, the sport you play is such a part of your life for so long. It's, it's hard to figure out how to replace that fix. And, and so for me, I work during the day, still have a full-time job, still have that to deal with. But whether it's broadcasting or working with kids, that's that's what helps keep me whole and what keeps me engaged in basketball. You said it perfectly there, and I've expressed similar sentiments uh, even in previous episodes here uh, with Walk On Perspective, just talking about how you almost are you're feeling empty when yeah, you're so playing because it's such a part of who you are and how you identify, and then when right. that's not there you're left with this void and a lot of people don't know how to fill it. And right. with your, your commentating career, I mean, that, that's got just to be a, a great way to scratch that itch. So kudos to you. You mentioned you're coaching some, some youth basketball up there as well. Would you say that you're more of a player's coach, Adam, or are you like, you know, in, in super intense, you know, this is, this is how you do it with the fundamentals. Yeah, I'm probably somewhere in between those two. Uh, you know, fortunately, I think it's uh, put it this way. It's easy to keep the long term perspective that uh, winning a game, losing a game when you're in third through eighth grade, probably not going to remember that 10 years from now. Right. But what you do remember is how do you build habits? And so what we spend a lot of time focused on is building those habits. How do you work hard? How do you push yourself beyond what's comfortable? How do you make sure that you're making the right plays and making the right plays for your teammates, not just yourself? Those are the type of things where I might get a little more surly about in terms of all the other stuff, miss shots, make shots, win or lose. Maybe I'm a little friendlier on that uh, from that standpoint. There you have it. Well, Adam, as we're kind of closing up here and winding down, uh, I typically always close. I, I like to have our guests finish with their school's uh, rallying cry. Is there a, a mantra or a, a phrase that's yelled at all the Drake basketball games? Is it just let's, let's go Drake or, you know, is, oh, give me your best let's go Drake Oof. that we can wrap up here with. Oof. Oof. I think the, the, the two phrases would just be let's go Drake or go Bulldogs. That's all I got. Let's go Drake, go Bulldogs. All right. There you have it. Well, Adam, I can't thank you enough for your time today, getting to know you a little bit more in your story. One that I was familiar with from having watched it in person in the moment, but obviously had, you know, had uh, eager to follow up and get a little bit more detail. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you having me and looking forward to keeping tabs on the walk on perspective moving forward. Yeah. And for our listeners who want to keep up with you and what you're currently doing, both professionally and with your broadcasting career, where can people find you on social media? Uh, at Adam Emmenecker on Twitter. Pretty easy. Just make sure you spell the name right. <laughs> All right. And there you have it. Thank you, Adam, for your time. Yep. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, that's going to do it for this episode of Walk on Perspective. We want to thank Adam again for his time. Uh, for sponsorship opportunities for the show, please email me at robert at walkonperspective.com. And you can find us on Twitter at WO Perspective and on Facebook and Instagram at Walk on Perspective. As always, thank you for listening and God bless.